My name is Laura Luopa, and I am a librarian with eCampus Ontario, and joining to me today are Leo Heck, who is also a librarian with eCampus Ontario, and our presenter, Lyle Williams. I'm going to leave it to Lyle to introduce himself. Before we begin today's session, I would like to share our land acknowledgement. The offices of eCampus Ontario are located in downtown Toronto and are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today, I am joining you from Sudbury, which is on the traditional lands of the Anishabe people of Turtle Island, the Atomishnikang, and Anishinaabek. And I will recognize the contributions of the Wanapate First Nation and the Métis Nation of Ontario. Please feel free to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. And Leo has also shared some links to our land acknowledgements. And now I'm going to hand over the uh, presentation to Lyle. Thank you, Laura. Give me a moment to share my screen. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves while I try to figure this out. Apologies. There we go. And share the sound. Okay. Laura, could I get a thumbs up that you can see and it is in full screen? Is that good? Excellent. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, not good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Lyle Williams, and I'm an adaptive technology specialist. And it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I'll, I'll describe myself. I am a middle age man wearing a black button up shirt. Um, I have black hair. I have a beard. Uh, and I'm wearing bilateral hearing aids. I have a hearing based disability. So I'm going to beg you to forgive me if I miss anything you say when you mic on. And I'll beg your forgiveness as well if I ask you to repeat anything you've said. I'll start by sharing my thank yous, since in many cases, thank yous are left and in many cases cut off at the end. So I'll thank Laura and the team for the support in putting together this webinar. I'll thank eCampus Ontario for offering this series, this suite of webinars and all the incredible, they, um, the incredible support they offer towards open education. And then of course, I'll thank you. I'll thank you for attending this session as you aim to expand your accessibility knowledge. And I recognize that we are all at a different place in our learning journey, particularly with alt text. Um, but like anything, the more you know, the more you realize there's more to know. This is almost an endless journey. And so I'll recognize that. Um, but we all we all have to start somewhere. And so let's start by knowing a little more about each other. Um, Laura did ask you to put where you're from, and I believe your institution in the chat, so we can skip that part. I think we captured that if you but if you haven't, feel free to add that to the chat. But what I'd love for you to do, if you don't mind is for you to give me an indication of where you are on this learning journey with alt text. And so I've got some numbers here on the screen. And what I'd love for you to do is to identify if you're a number one, meaning you don't know very much about alt text. It's relatively new to you. You arguably can't spell alt text. Put a number one in the chat, that'd be helpful. If you're a number two, you know, you have a good familiarity with it. You're comfortable-ish using it. You have some strengths that you're developing there. And then if you're a three, meaning you can teach the world about alt text, um, put the three into the chat as well. Um, and if you're a three, I might invite you to run this session. Natasha, I see you out there. Um, yeah, so if you can put a one, a two, a three, Natasha, put a three. Thank you, Natasha. Here my... You're my support. Appreciate that. Um, 1.89, Leo, very precise and specific. <laughs> That's good. Um, good, 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 good. So these are important. This gives me a sense of, of, of who's in the room and, and what we're looking at. And so I'm going to try my best to provide as much information and clarity 
Um, but again, it's a learning journey. So if you start here, this might be the beginning of where you attack other resources and grow that knowledge. You'll notice all of my slides will start with alt equals quotes. Um, and then there's text inside those quotes. And this is me trying to be cute yet informative as this is the code, alt equals quote. This is the code that exists in applications and in tools that inform these things called screen readers that they're to announce alternate text or alt text. And so this is a bit of um, nerdy Cody stuff. Uh, we're not going to go there. We're not going to get into technical aspects of doing alt text. We're going to try to stay um, higher level. Uh, going into the code gives me the heebie-jeebies. Maybe that's the same for other people as well, and we don't want to mess with that. So everything we're going to be doing is going to be identifying alt text and entering it into graphical user interfaces. So boxes, text boxes, things like that. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's begin. Let's begin. Actually, no, I missed my quote. Uh, there's an MLK, a Martin Luther King quote at the bottom. It says, you don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step, right? And so that's why you're here. I'm hopeful that's why you're here to take this first step towards alternative text. Okay. I want to borrow your so-called mind's eye as I attempt to paint a, a picture, an image for you. I'm going to read you a description. So you're welcome to close your eyes and just sort of process what I'm going to say here. Imagine a grand moonlit ship deck, the ocean's expanse stretching into the horizon. A young woman, elegantly dressed, stands at the ship's railing, feeling the chill wind. A man, equally young and determined, approaches her, offering his hand. Together, they step onto the ship's edge, facing the vast sea ahead. Can you tell me who, or not who, what this image is presenting? Can anyone identify what this image is from? Yes, we have some people that are keen. <laughs> they know. Titanic, king of the world, very good. Yeah, so that image that I constructed verbally helped paint a picture, bring you back to a time when you might have first watched that movie Titanic, right? There's a lot of description in there, enough to draw up memories and connect you to that scenery. Let's try this again. Imagine a bustling Italian restaurant, its cozy tables filled with patrons, engaging in an evening. In one magical moment, two dogs, a cocker spaniel and a mutt, share a plate of spaghetti, unknowingly eating the same strand until their noses meet over a single romantic meatball. Shazia on the ball instantly lays the trap. People are good here. People are really good. Again, another iconic scene that captures a simple expression of love and connection universally recognized. And so this process of describing imagery is something that we all have the capacity to do, right? And what we want to do is we want to use the power of this imagery to convey information to individuals who are blind, low vision, etc. Images convey, in some cases, a tremendous wealth of information and can also provide an emotional connection, right? That might have brought you back to that romantic scene in Titanic. Images can be still or static images, like what I have on the screen there. Or they can be dynamic, like GIFs or GIFs, however you say them, I don't know. Or interactive imagery, like a hotspot in H5P content, right? We have lots of flexibility in how we place images. Extending beyond that, images can be informational, like a chart or a graph. They can be decorative, like logos or iconography, or they can be instructional, <clears throat> like screenshots 
or application windows. So we can use them in, a multi, in, in multiple ways. How the image is being used plays to how important it is in context. So we look at the image on a slide and we can determine a lot about what the image is conveying. And so you can see on my screen here, I have an image of what looks like an EKG with a stethoscope, right? This could tell a lot of information depending on how it's placed into a document. I haven't done that. In this case, I'm just using it as an example, but a content author like yourself, a developer of content will use images to express additional information to a reader. Now I wanna show you some images and I want you to use the chat to write a word or two representing the first thought that comes to your mind. And I want you to describe it as an emotion or a feeling you get from this image. So again, you can use the chat to write this emotion or this feeling. First image. What comes to mind when you see this? Power. Interesting how many people said power. Fierce, yellow, beauty, threat, intensity. Very good. Fear, kitty. It's cute. Um, right. So it invokes all kinds of images, uh, sorry, all kinds of feelings for us about this image. And you'll notice I put some alt text down there. We're going to talk more about alt text, but just to give you a sense, a photo of a lion looking to the left of the viewer. That could be one example of alt text. Let's try again. Let's use another image. In this case, it's going to be a GIF or a GIF, a moving image. So if you can describe the feeling you get when you see this, peaceful, relaxing, calm, vacation time, absolutely. Bored, <laughs> okay, good, tranquility. Beautiful, right? And so again, still images can invoke emotion. Moving images or dynamic images can invoke emotion. Um, trigger warning, my next one might scare some people. I apologize ahead of time. What brings up emotion with this image? Danger, very good. Fascination, focus, yes. Good, good. Beauty, yeah, absolutely. To me, it's scary as can be, but to someone else, this is beautiful. Um, very good. So we gain a significant amount of information, emotion, context from images. And the sentiment it brings to people is important. Images play this really critical role in our expression, as well as our understanding. So you as content authors, what you're trying to express, to readers or viewers, and then as well as us as consumers of information, what we're to understand from this imagery. Let's, let's talk a bit more about what this means. This means there's a problem with images. Images can pose an accessibility challenge, and particularly for individuals who are blind, individuals who are low vision, those who may have comprehension or cognition challenges, or those who may even have bandwidth or internet issues. They pose a potential challenge to users. So we just discussed how important it is for images to convey information. We want to ensure as developers, as content authors, and even as consumers that this information is not lost. So I want you to think about digital textbooks with no images. Could you imagine that would make sense? Could you think about a learning management system without the capacity to have images in it? I'll extend that thought to the web. Imagine Facebook not having a capacity to store images or Instagram <laughs> with no images. All of these images are critical to our understanding or connecting with the content and they should not be concealed from any readers. I'm sure you're gonna agree that people with disabilities must have an equivalent experience accessing imagery. 
And that's why alt text is so important. It represents that bridge to accessible image communication. Let's define it. Let's define alt text. So alt text is a contraction of alternative text, otherwise known as alt tags or alt descriptions. Alt text is written content that appears in place of an image on digital content. Alt text helps these things called screen readers describe images to readers who may be blind or low vision or those other disabilities I mentioned. Said another way, alt text is a short written description of an image which makes sense of that image when it cannot be viewed. On this slide, you'll see some examples of screen readers. And for those who don't know, a screen reader is a technology that uses speech synthesizers to read any content on a web page or a document. Among the more popular ones are JAWS, J-A-W-S, or NVDA. There's another one called Zoom Text, which is a magnifier. It magnifies the screen and it does screen reading. But built into most of our everyday items that we use have free screen readers. For example, our Windows users, you have a tool called Narrator. Our Mac, Apple users, you have uh, a tool called VoiceOver. And our Android users, you have something called TalkBack. All of these are freely available and I encourage you to make a note to yourself to check these out on your devices. And I'll even encourage you to go one step further and download a copy of NVDA if you're a Windows user. It's a free, powerful screen reader that you can use to test your own content. Speaking of screen readers, let's take a look at one in action. So we're gonna listen to this screen reader. This is a sample of alt text being read on a web page. So this is a CBC article. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have it read the paragraph above the image. It's then going to read the alt text of that image. And then it's going to read the caption below the image. So you're going to hear all three bits. Now, you're going to be a little frustrated. I apologize because it's playing at a speed that many people with low vision or who are blind set their screen reader to a really fast pace because they can get through content. Not everyone, but many users will get through content much quicker until so they can increase the speed and they've trained their brain to read much faster than most of us. And so here's an example of a screen reader in action. In 1953 and 1955, the middle of the Cold War, the Canadian government forcibly relocated more than 90 Inuit roughly 2,000 kilometers from their homes in northern Quebec to show that the high Arctic was occupied. They were brought to two virtually uninhabitable places, Resolute Bay and Gricefjord, both in Nunavut. As details graphic a black and white photo of a large open boat approaching a mountainous coast, the water is covered in ice. Caption archival footage from telling our story. Tira Inuit. Okay, hey, fast, real fast. Um, I want you to try to listen to it one more time and see if you can pick up when it gets to the alt text. Try to see if you can get to the alt text part. Here it goes. In 1953 and 1955, the middle of the Cold War, the Canadian government forcibly relocated more than 90 Inuit, roughly 2,000 kilometers from their homes in northern Quebec to show that the high Arctic was occupied. They were brought to two virtually uninhabitable places, Resolute Bay and Gricefjord, both in Nunavut. As details graphic a black and white photo of a large open boat approaching a mountainous coast, the water is covered in ice. Caption archival footage from telling our story. Tara Inuit. Good. So you may not have heard it because it was fast, but the screen reader stated graphic. It told the user it's about to announce the alt text for a graphic. And then it read a black and white photo of a large open boat approaching a mountainous coast. The water is covered in ice. Within the context of this article, it goes on to talk about how an indigenous group of people were relocated by the Canadian government to an uninhabitable place 2,000 kilometers north of where they originally were living in order for the government to establish sovereignty in the Arctic. So there's a lot more context behind just what that image was showing. I'm gonna see if I can go back and make it so the image is a little clearer. For you. Right, so there's the image that was being shown. So this is not just a photo of people on an expedition, but it's, it's depicting people being relocated. 
And the context of this article helps paint a better picture of what's actually happening. I would argue the alt text was wrong. It should have been, or it could have been, a group of Inuit people being relocated via an open boat across the icy waters to a remote and rugged mountainous region of the Arctic. That tells me much more about what this image is trying to depict than what they gave. And so we want to provide that level of detail without too much. We don't want to write paragraphs and paragraphs. We want to pre pre present enough detail with good use of adjectives to make it clear about what's happening in an image. I've said a lot. I'm going to pause there for a moment. If there's any questions that I might have missed or any questions you want to ask or clarity you want to seek before we go on. And if not, that's fine too. But I just want to give you a chance. Are some screen readers better than others? I am not a person with vision loss, so I wouldn't be the best to judge in my work with students. I find the majority of students that I work with use JAWS. That's a, an industry tool that's used uh, around the world. It's a very popular, commonly used tool, but it comes at a cost, a significant cost. JAWS can cost over $1,000 up to $2,000. Whereas uh, the built-in ones that are on our devices are okay. If you're stuck and you need to get by, you can use it. It's not the best, but they're okay. Um, NVDA, really good alternative a really good alternative. Um, so yes, there is a little bit of a ranking among them. Okay, excellent. If I miss anything, I'm going to try to get back to that chat and catch up. So what we want to do now is I want to, I want to practice a little bit. Now that we have a definition of what alt text is, I want to solidify it with some examples. And I recognize so far we only have the definition. We don't have the rules. The rules will come. I'll get to the rules in a bit, but I just want to get a sense of your capacity to write alt text. So there's no pressure. I give out free points when I do activities like this so you can earn some points. They're great points. So I want you to use the chat to write the alt text for this image. Okay, so take a moment, reflect on what you see, and then write me some alt text, please. Throw it into the chat when you're ready. A red apple, a shiny red apple set against a white background. Thank you, Marissa. Very good. A red delicious apple on a white background. Shiny red apple. Alt equals, look at that, Sophia. A red apple on a white background. Very good. Or sorry, Sophie, not Sophia. Good. Right, so there's no wrong in what you've done. There's no wrong in what you've done. You've described what you see, an apple. You could have done that, as simple as that. An apple, um, uh, um, a red apple, give it a descriptor. A red apple with a brown stem, a red apple on a white background. These are all options that you could have put up. Do the words red and white mean something to people who have never seen colors? It's a great question. Um, if there is anyone who happens to be partially sighted or blind, if you can share your perspective, I'd love to hear that. Uh, I would argue that you know you want to you want to define and dis and and create alt text that's consumable by as many people as possible. So for someone who has no light perception and has never seen a color before, right through to someone who has partial sightedness and can still discern, and so the red will give some clarity to what they're looking at. Let's now go from this practice number one to practice number two. Let's try another version of this apple. So you can see the apple has changed. Something is different about this. So I'll encourage you again to use the chat and to write, what do you see? How would you describe this image? Go ahead.
two dimensional red apple with a bite taken out on the right side. Good. Oh, these are flying through. I can't keep up. Um, apple appears flat. It has a green leaf above separated by good. Real life interpretation of the Apple Company logo. Interesting, Kyle. Um, Sophie with the alt. Yes, Apple logo depicted using a realistic apple. Interesting. You're seeing it. A drawing a red apple. Very good. Right. So you're you're describing a bite taken out of an apple would be a good descriptor of what's happening here. But context plays an important role. On its own, you can only describe what you see, a bite taken out of an apple. But if this con if this image is placed within the context of it representing the percentage of students who go hungry in schools, meaning that little bite represents maybe 10% of that population of students goes hungry each day, it has an entirely different meaning. The context has changed. And so it's really important that when we're defining our alt text, we're considering how it's placed among the other text. What does it mean to the reader? And if it has meaning, we need to provide descriptive alt text. If it doesn't have meaning, if it's just decorative, artistic, then it does not need to have that much specificity to it. Let's go on to a third image. Some of you saw this ahead of time. So what is it? What is on the screen? What do you see? Apple company logo in black. Good. Apple logo, black image of an apple. Oh, I can't keep up. I can't keep up. And black image of an apple and stem with a bite taken out on the right. It is commonly known as the Apple company logo. Very good, Chris. Yeah, so there's a lot of description in Chris's definition. So in this case, we have a logo, correct. A decorative element that represents the Apple Corporation. This no longer has to do with an organic apple, right? This is all to do with a company. So how this image is used in the article will dictate how you write the alt text. If it's just a logo that's being placed and not giving any context or adding any context or value, it's a decorative piece. But if it's part of an article talking about Apple versus Android or versus Microsoft or anything else, then you're gonna to need to define it within that context. Good, you're getting it. Excellent. So let's talk about writing alt text. How do you do it? When it comes to writing alt text, we want to do a couple things. We want to be as descriptive as we can while equally being concise. That might be a contradiction of terms for some of us. And it's a challenge, I'll be honest. It's not easy initially to start writing alt text. It's, a, it's an art, as this presentation is. Uh, labeled. We want to find that that appropriate amount of description of an image while equally being concise. For example, if you're showing a graph, don't just describe the colors or the shapes. Explain what the graph illustrates, such as a bar graph showing an increase in solar energy usage from 2010 to 2020. This way, the information conveyed by the image is accessible to everyone. And I want you to think about it like a tweet for those who use, I don't know if it's X now, right? The idea of sending out a, a shortened message. You have a limited number of characters to convey your message. So it's important to remember that because you don't want to get your content cut off. Some screen readers might cut off how much you write. So always put the most important pieces about your descriptive text at the front end. Start with those pieces. We want to focus on the context and the function. So consider the image's role in the content. Is it illustrating a point? Is it adding visual interest? Your alt text should reflect this purpose, ensuring that the function of the image is clear to someone who cannot see it. Now, here's the caveat. Not all images require alt text. Decorative images, 
that add no additional information or context should be excluded from having alt text. And then lastly, we want to avoid any redundancy. So don't get in the habit or stop the habit of writing image of or picture of diagram of. We don't need those words. It's unnecessary because the screen reader will announce the presence of the image before it reads the description. So skip all that and go right to the, des the description that you're trying to write. If you remember a couple slides ago, we looked at the, um, the boat and it said graphic and then it read the alt text description. So you can skip the redundancy of writing image of or picture of. So we're getting this idea that we have to be describing our images, especially as they relate to the context that we're living in. Let's look at some examples of good alt text. So on the screen, we have an image. And without knowing the context or knowing who this person is, we want to consider what we want to write. So if we just have this picture of this gentleman here. We might write a person in a suit. That's one option. A man at a desk. A professional photograph of a man in a suit. These are things that you could consider writing without knowing much about this individual and what this image means. But depending on the context, the alt text you write will be massively different. And so we want to look at some examples of how we could place this image into context. So this first example here, you'll see we have the image. We have no caption below the image, but there is a block of text with a description of who this person is. And this is Lincoln Alexander, a Canadian lawyer and politician who became the first Black Canadian to be a member of Parliament in the House of Commons, a federal cabinet minister, a chair of the Workers' Compensation Board of Ontario, and the 24th Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, a distinguished individual here. This provides much of the needed context for this image. So in this case, the alt text of the image should be Lincoln Alexander to inform the reader that the corresponding image relates to this block of text about them. Okay, let's look at another example. Two, in this case, we're given the image, check. We're given the caption underneath the image, check two and we're given the block of text, check three. So the reader is given quite a bit of information. This means there is not a need to add alt text because we have this caption right below the image and we have this block of text defining who this individual is. So you can mark this as decorative. If you don't know what that word, there's a new word you're gonna to add to your lexicon. Decorative images. And decorative images are ones that do not present important information or do not have a specific function in your content. We have enough bits of information here that we don't need to define that with alt text. Let's look at a third example. In this case, we have an image and we have a caption and they're linked to a web page. Okay, but we've lost that block of text below. And the link is taking us to the Canadian Encyclopedia bio for Lincoln Alexander, and it's at canadianencyclopedia.ca. And so this is providing users with navigation in terms of where this is going to take them. Since the caption indicating who the image is is there, we have the caption, and the link takes us to a website with more information, then our alt text can simply be politician, Lincoln Alexander. So it's letting the person know who this person is or the field they're in is a politician and who they are. And what would happen with the screen reader, the voice synthesizer would read this as link, letting the user know that there's a link, image, letting the user know that there's an image, 
It would read the alt text, politician Lincoln Alexander, and it would read the caption, Lincoln Alexander, politician. Lots of information the user is getting when you provide alt text like this. Okay, so we have good information when we have the image and we have a link and we know what this link is about or where it's taking a user. Okay, let's look at a fourth option here. Aha, we don't have an image now. We've lost the image. And so we just have a link. And sometimes, you know, you've probably seen this in your internet travels. Click here, link to, select. We see a lot of these options when we're searching the internet, when we're surfing the internet, but they don't provide enough information. They don't tell a user what this click here is doing, where it's taking them. And so we always want to err on the side of providing users with a description of what they're about to select in plain language whenever possible. So in this case, we're linking to the Canadian Encyclopedia bio on Alexander. And we have this description block of text below. So the text reader, or the screen reader rather, will announce that there is a link to Lincoln Alexander politician, and that will take them to that website. This is good alt text. This is good information for a user to know where they're about to be sent. Okay, so we wanna get in the habit of creating these clearly labeled links. No more click here's or um, um, select, okay? What are we taking away from this? There's some pieces we wanna take away. I want you to get in the habit from now on, anytime you embed an image in something you're creating that you will now make a promise to yourself to always add alt text or mark it as decorative. Okay, I want you to always do this from now on. Anytime you're dropping an image into a learning management system, a press book, into a Word, PowerPoint, PDF file to provide descriptive alt text where possible or to mark it as decorative. And we wanna describe what we see, describe what's happening. We wanna describe for dynamic, static, active, all kinds of imagery. And we wanna describe what's happening in the scene. So we have an image here where you have a, a GIF, a GIF, whatever it's called, of Lucille Ball. And so this alt text should be something of the effect of Lucille Ball hurriedly stuffing chocolates coming off a conveyor belt down her uniform. That could be one example of alt text you can use. It's giving a lot of information about who this person is, what they're doing, and the actions that they're taking. Good alt text is there, okay? Let's talk about some don'ts, some do's and some don'ts. We do want to describe, we've hit, we've hit this quite a few times, we want to describe what we're seeing in an image and the interactions that are occurring in that image. But we're not going to use the old graphic of or image of. We're not going to write too much information that's too verbose. And we're going to write um, alt text when it's necessary and mark images as decorative when it's not. And so if you look at this slide here, we have a, a GIF, GIF of Bruce Lee. This doesn't have much relationship to the slide. I would be inclined to mark this as decorative because it's not giving a lot of information relative to what's happening on the slide here. Okay, so you want to consider this when you're making your presentations. Am I, am I adding more information? I'm going to describe it. If I'm not, it's going to be, it's going to be left as a decorative piece. So we want to test what we know. I've left you some Easter eggs throughout this presentation of bad alt text, bad alt text. Now I wanna apply what we've been exploring here to identify what's bad or what's wrong about these bits of alt text that have been written. So let's take a look at this. I think this is a 
moving image. Can I play it? Yes, I can. Okay. So in this image, I have man taking a photo with camera shutter. Oh, I can't read it. Sorry. My zoom screen is cutting off. Man taking a photo with camera shutter pointed directly at the viewer with both hands holding the camera and the background obscured. So in the chat, using the words good or bad, is that good alt text or is that bad alt text? Bad, thank you, Danielle. Anyone else? I would say this is decorative, so no need, okay. Bad. Describing the trees rather than the forest. <laughs> Too wordy. Yeah, you're getting it. You're getting it. This is way too wordy. There's way too much information given to the reader with this image, right? We want to write descriptive, clear, simplified alt text, right? Man adjusting the focus on a camera. Simple, right? Describes what's happening in this image. Let's look at another image. Back to our lion. What would you say? Is this good alt text or bad? This says a photo, sorry, I gotta zoom in here. A photo of a lion looking to the left of the viewer. Is that good alt text or bad alt text? Don't use photo, absolutely. We're not, we're, we're out of that business of using photo of, image of, graphic of, thumbs down, absolutely. Good, remove the photo. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could have a description like that. You could call it a lion because that's what it is, right? We don't need to know about the mane and the direction of the, the lines looking. All these other bits of information might be superfluous. It might be unnecessary. And so we can focus stri strictly on the fact that, yes, it's just a lion. Let's try this next one. This was our waves. What do we have? We have a GIF of water. Okay, so that's a giveaway. Um, not specific enough, bad, yes, water. Yeah, uh, there's much more happening in this dynamic image than just saying water, right? We potentially have waves lapping the shore of a beach. That tells me a lot more about what's happening in this image. Yeah, waves on a beach, very good. So now that we've gotten a better handle on writing this alt text, where do we put it? <laughs> where do we enter this alt text? Let's take a look at that. So for our PowerPoint users in the world, what you're gonna do is you're gonna drop your image into your PowerPoint, step one. You're then gonna right click on your image and select alt text. That's this one in the middle here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. And then on the right side, this widget or this panel or pane will pop up. And Microsoft's done a really good job. They've really advanced accessibility um, with their products these past few years and, and really been honing in on developing good tools that are part of the platform. And so you can see they've gone into some detail here. They've said, how would you describe this object and its context to someone who is blind or low vision? The subject in detail, the setting, the actions or interactions, other relevant information. And they even tell you, write one or two sentences as your alt text. They give you a text box to enter it. And then they've even given you the option at the bottom here to mark it as decorative, which is really helpful. They've also added generative AI, the ability for this product to assess the image that you put in there and identify what it determines is in that image. Now, remember, this is a computer and it's not gonna do as good of a job as a human. So check, anytime you use that generate alt text for me, check what it's written and adjust it, right? Make it more clear, more descriptive because it's probably gonna make some mistakes when it does that. So don't rely on it, that's my message. Don't rely on it as a, as a solution to alt text. And so you can see this is PowerPoint. Let's look at Word. In Microsoft Word, 
similar but different. We have uh, dropped an image into the Word doc, step one. When you drop images into Word, you'll see the picture menu item appear on the ribbon. You'll select that. And then you'll see alt text will appear on the right side of the ribbon. And what they've given you is they've given you two abilities or two ways rather to enter your alt text. You can add a short description for, for the title, and then you can add a longer description for what's happening. And so we have cow in pasture as our short title, and then a cow in the foreground of a pasture while other cows are in the background as our longer description. So it gives you lots of flexibility in terms of how you write your alt text in Word. Let's look at Adobe. A lot of our institutions have institutional licenses for Adobe Acrobat, the tool that allows us to create PDF files. In Adobe, we have this tool called the accessibility, um, an accessibility tool, right? It's this little purple icon here that runs down the side of Adobe. When you click on it, you'll then be given the option to set alternate text. You'll select that. And when you click on select, uh, set alternate text, this window will appear. And this allows for you to navigate very quickly and easily through all the images that are in your PDF file, right? And so you can type the alt text, you can mark it as decorative, and you use the back and forward buttons to navigate through all images in that PDF. So really easy tool that they've incorporated to identify your alt text for images. Learning management systems. So at my institution, we use Brightspace or Desire to Learn D2L. Um, eCampus Ontario, I believe they also have Brightspace. Whenever you drop an image into Brightspace, it will pop up this dialogue, provide alternative text. And you have the ability again to type out your alt text or to mark it as decorative. So lots of really simple and direct and clear ways for us to use the tools we use every day to mark items with alt text. The last one I wanna talk about is Pressbooks. I think a lot of us are using these more and more in our teaching and are developing them. And so when you drop an image into a press book, there's a little pencil right up here that appears. That's the edit button. If you click on that, that will pop up this dialogue, allowing you to set the alternative text. And what they say is leave it empty if you're using it as a decorative image. So lots of different ways we can put alt text into the content that we use. All right, um, let's look at some examples. I have three elements on this slide. I have a bunch of links or formatting of how you can write a URL. I have a logo and I have a banner or a marketing promotional graphic that's on the screen. For the um, formatting of the URL, I've given you four options. I want you to look at these four options and I want you to assess which one of these options would be the most effective way to inform a user about the link. And then in the chat, I want you to write an A, a B. Like, oh, you're already ahead of me, look at your people flying. Uh, D's, yes, <laughs> lots of D's. Yeah, because we've talked about click here. We're not in that business anymore. We're out of that business. B, it's the link. You don't need to write ecampusontario.ca links. C, redundancy. Too much information is there. And then D is clear and direct in terms of what's happening, where it's going for the user. Very good. Beautifully done. Um, the next one is the logo. Ecampus Ontario. What would we do with this? What alt text would we, could we, should we write for this image? You can put that into the chat. Decorative, Sophie, nice. Decorative, Leah, good. Yeah, decorative. In many cases, not in all, 
in most, a logo is going to be marked as decorative. It's not adding a whole lot of context or content um, perspective to a user. So we can mark those quite comfortably as decorative. Not in all cases, you know, don't make it a blanket rule, but for the most part, you're going to do that. If it was being used in the article in comparison with other things, then yes, we might need to look at writing some alt text for it. The third one, the banner here, advanced francophone higher education in Ontario. What alt text should we write for that? What do you think? It depends if your context involves promoting Frank. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. It depends. This is a trick question. It depends on where that graphic is living. What's happening with that graphic? It's very situation specific. And so don't just think that you can apply a rule always and it's going to work for everything. You have to consider how you're developing your content around any graphic. Very good. It absolutely depends. Uh, ooh, we're running out of time. Okay. Um, I had, if you, if, if you, if we have time for this, I had an opportunity for us to practice. And so I'd love if we can at least get to one of these items in this practice. And so what I've done is I've built a Padlet and I'm going to put it into the chat in a second. But what I want you to do is I want you to go to the link. I want you to look at the first image that's there. It actually doesn't matter. For the sake of time, we don't have time. So just pick any of the images that are there. And I want you to write alt text for it. Okay. And then when I say go, I want you to submit it. So don't submit it until everyone's had a chance to write theirs. And then I want to have a quick little chat about how we interpreted these image images differently. So I'm going to pop this link into the chat. I think I did it right. Hopefully that opens up on your end. Oh, Laura, way ahead of me. Um, so that link is in the chat. If you can click on it, and then if you can, in Padlet, if you're familiar, you'll see a little plus button in the bottom right corner. When you click on the plus button, a little window will pop up for you to type your alt text, and then don't press submit until, oh, 404 on Laura's. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, use mine. Let me put mine back in the chat again. 